Is he making another video about optical comparator screens? Sure looks like it. Let's see if he's learned anything from his mistakes. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. About a year ago, I used a diode laser and Surmark to make a replacement glass screen for an optical comparator for my friend Andre. We tried a bunch of different combinations of normal and mirror image artwork burned on the front and the back of the glass with spray-on glass frosting. What didn't make it into that video, however, was some testing that we did on a piece of pre-frosted glass. It didn't turn out as well as I would have liked, but today I have a chance to try again and see if I can learn something from my mistakes. Soon after I published the video on making the comparator glass for Andre's comparator, Lance Baltzley of 26 Acre Maker contacted me and asked if I could help him with a comparator that he's restoring or putting back into service. Told him I could and he sent me a piece of glass and asked if I could burn some artwork into it. Send me a nice little note here. Let's take a look at what he sent. Now you'll remember in the previous videos when I was working on glass for comparators, I tried cutting circles out of sheet glass and actually had a lot of trouble controlling the diameter and actually getting a smooth circle. The reason for that is because when you score glass and then run the crack from the score line, it doesn't go straight down through the glass, it actually wanders a little bit because the glass is an amorphous solid, there really isn't anything to guide that crack straight down. I had a lot of people suggest, well, why don't you just score it on both sides? Yeah, it doesn't work that way. The crack starts from one side and goes through, has no idea where the other crack is. So really the only way to get a good circle of glass is to cut it oversize and grind it. And that is exactly what we have here. This, I don't, know the full story on this piece of glass, but I believe this was actually a comparator screen, but the artwork on it is long gone. If you've ever worked on one of these and you've ever tried to clean one of these screens, then you know that however they print the, the, the graticule on here is really, really delicate. If you use any kind of solvent, you put acetone on it and start wiping it, it just comes off. And that's exactly what happened to Andre's, and that's why he needed a new piece of glass. And in this case, I think Lance has multiple screens for the comparator, and this is one that he said didn't have artwork on it, but it had a bunch of marks on it from the previous owner, so he just cleaned it up to see if he could get a good frosted surface. And what he did is he actually just took a precision flat ground stone and WD-40 and just went to town trying to clean up the glass. And as you can see, there's a little bit of kind of dark haze over here on the edges. You may not even be able to see that on camera, but this just cleaned up beautifully. So we've got a really nice frosted side and a nice, pretty much unscratched glossy side as well. Now the interesting question is, which side should we put the artwork on? The image is gonna be projected on the hazy side of the, on the frosted side of the glass. And so you really wanna put the artwork on that side. And in the original comparators, the artwork would go printed in reverse on the back side of the glass so that the image is projected through and you see the shadow of the artwork and the shadow of the piece that you're measuring. The problem with the Surmark process that we're gonna use with the laser is that if you do burn that in from the back side, it actually pits the glass a little bit. So from the side where you actually put the markings on, it looks great, it looks nice and dark and black. But if you turn it over and look at the other side, you're actually looking at those black marks through little pits in the glass. And they pick up specular highlights and they're reflective and so it's sort of shiny and grainy and it really obscures the image. Andre actually did have an extra piece of frosted glass and we did try burning the reverse image for viewing from the back side and it really doesn't look good at all. However, if you flip it around, project through the unfrosted side onto the frosted surface, you have the frosted surface on the front with the surmark, it looks fantastic. Unfortunately, for Andre, uh, his ended up with the, we only had one to test, so we actually burned it on with the artwork reversed. So if he turns it so that he has good contrast, everything is reversed. 
We don't have to make that mistake here. We can go ahead and plan on having the frosted side out, burning the artwork on the frosted side, and we should get a good result. Won't be exactly like the factory piece, but it should be pretty good. Now this glass does look like it's a little bit bigger than the one I did for Andre. Uh, his was, I believe, 10 and 3 30 seconds. And this looks like it's a little bit bigger. And it is. Looks like 10, 368 and a half. 10, 368, yeah, this is actually really, really round. Yeah, so 10, 368 and a half should be fine. And so we'll, we'll need to adjust the artwork for that. The other thing that I wanna do before I try to burn anything into this is I wanna clean this really well. I'm sure he already did, but since he worked this surface over with WD-40 and a flat stone, I wanna make sure that all of the residue of the WD-40 is gone, just so that it doesn't interfere with the Surmark process. I'm just, just gonna use some Windex here and just clean this up. Use plenty to make sure that we cut through any oil that's on the surface. I really don't see any signs of contamination. I think we're gonna be good here. Before I actually spray Lance's one of a kind piece of glass, I have a piece of dumpster glass here that I'm going to burn. So I'm gonna go ahead and coat that. This is what I'm using. This is Surmark Black Laser Marking Spray. Now, in the previous videos, I had a bunch of people tell me, just to get a can of Molly Lube, it's exactly the same stuff. And while this does have a molybdenum compound in it as the black pigment, this isn't just Molly Lube. This has got a bunch of basically powdered glass and ceramic materials in it. And so that powder lays down, and yes, it does have black moly in it as a pigment, but it lays down an unfused layer of ceramic powder. And then when you hit it with the laser, it melts and fuses that ceramic to the glass or to the metal or to whatever you're using. So while yes, it's my understanding, I haven't done it, that you can mark metal with black moly lube, uh, it's not the same thing as this. And you know, if you're just trying to get a black mark, it is a much cheaper way to go. But if you want a nice ceramic mark, this stuff is, uh, is probably a better option. Though it is not cheap. They are very proud of this. You don't have to go crazy with this stuff. You just need a layer that you can't see through. Okay, I think that looks good. We'll just let this dry while I go set up the laser. This is the artwork I made a year ago for Andre's comparator, and I need to make a few changes to this before I burn the glass for Lance. Let me go ahead and get rid of the glass sheet model here and get back to just this sketch, and let's edit it. Now, the very first thing that we need to do is change the diameter. This is for 10 and 3 30 seconds glass, and Lance's is a little bit bigger. So I'll double click here, and instead of 10 and 3 30 seconds, it's 10.3685. Give that a moment to recompute. This is a pretty complex model with a lot of inefficient relationships set up between the components, so sometimes it takes a little while to recompute. Now that does make the glass a little bit bigger. Um, I don't think we need to expand the artwork in the center. I think we'll just leave that and we'll let the markings move out. I'll probably want to come back and adjust the location of all these numbers though.
Okay, that looks a little bit better. I'm just going to go ahead and save the file here just because what we're going to do next requires a bunch of recompute, and I have locked up Fusion before doing stuff like this. Edit the sketch again. Now the other thing that I want to change is I need to change the dimensions of these sectors, of these um, partial circles for measuring diameter. I screwed this up in the initial video and I had a few people pointed out to me in the comments. The issue is that these are supposed to be spaced at one tenth of an inch or 100 thou intervals, but I took the line, this is the center line right here, the horizontal center line of the circle, and I pulled a line down from that a uh, certain distance, uh, looks like 35 thou, so that these lines wouldn't actually touch that. And then I spaced out a set of points on this line at 10th of an inch intervals to control the diameters of these uh, quarter circles. The problem is that for the radius of this inner quarter circle to be a 10th of an inch, this point would need to be up on the x-axis. It would actually need to be in line with the center of the circle, and it is not. I didn't realize that error when I did this, so the radius of this line is not a tenth of an inch as I have it measured here. In fact, let's look and see what it is. It is actually 95 thou. So it's not a big difference, and as the circles get bigger, the error is smaller. So if I measure this one out here, this one uh, is supposed to be 700 and it's 701. So as these things get bigger, the error gets smaller. Let's do one out here. Yeah, this is supposed to be 1.4 and it really is about 1.4. So the error gets smaller as we go out, but it's still incorrect. So I wanna come in here and fix this. So the offset we have here is a variable sector offset. I just wanna remember that. And I'm gonna go ahead and start deleting some geometry and we'll reform it in the correct position. So we'll start with this horizontal line. I am gonna want one here, but I need to deal with all of these points first. So I've just highlighted that, hit the delete key, and it's deleted it. The other thing that I wanna do is I wanna get rid of all the points that I have on the ends of these quarter circles. So I'm gonna to try to select these as much as I can. So if I start from the left and rubber band to the right, come on Fusion, you can do it and rubber band to the right and cover over those points, it's going to select just the points. If I rubber band from the left, it will select everything that even partially intersects that rectangle. So it selects these lines. So I wanna go from left to right. I'm trying to get this as level as I can here so I can select just those points. And I'll go ahead and hit delete. I just want to take off all the points from the ends of these arcs. Great. Now we're going to actually go and put the points back where they should be. Let me get rid of this dimension. I'll just say create point, and I will go ahead and put a point right here. D for dimension, and we'll dimension that off of the center line, 0.1 inches. Great. Now the other thing that I want to do is I want to make sure that these points are still the same distance from the edge here. So I will go through and hit control and just select all of these points and I will mark them all as horizontal with one another. That way they don't have to be constrained on a line. I don't need that line that I deleted. Now there aren't actually points here. All I'm doing is selecting the end points of the arc. With all of those selected, I'll hit the horizontal vertical constraint, give it a moment to compute, and now those are all constrained to be together horizontally in a line, and then I'll set the distance, D for dimension, and we'll go from there to the center point, move around until we get this vertical, and this will be the sector offset value. Great, so those endpoints are now all constrained vertically. Now I have my point here, I'll select that, and I'll say create rectangular pattern for directions. I'll select just the horizontal here. In the vertical, I'll just make that one, and I need 
I think 20 to 50 of these. Let's find out. And I want spacing of 0.1 inches. Oop, minus 0.1 inches. Okay, so that's laid out a series of points. Do I have enough of them? I have more than I need. There we go, 40. So now I need to just go back and actually move these lines or move these arcs into the correct position. And we're gonna do that with the coincident constraint. So I'll click coincident, I'll click the arc, I'll click the point, and it should move it into the correct position. And now let's check the radius of this. And there, the radius is exactly 0.1 inches, which is what we want. So I will just go through and fix the rest of them. And unfortunately, because this model has so many constraints, or this sketch has so many constraints, the compute performance is pretty poor. I think that's all we need to do to the artwork. I think I would like to add an additional line around the outside just to make things a little bit easier for alignment on the laser so we can burn a border to set the glass into. So I will just hit O for offset, select this outside circle, and we'll offset it one millimeter. This is 39 thousandths of an inch, that's about one millimeter. Click OK, that gives us that line. And I think that is all we need. We just need to export this as a DXF. So right click on the sketch, save as DXF. And we should be ready to pull that into Lightburn. I have my laser set up here. This is an Xtool D1. This is the, I guess, second version of the laser that they made. This is the 10 watt blue version. They have a whole bunch of different versions now, all the way up to 40 watts. I haven't used any of those. This is the only one that I have. And I do have it sitting on a three quarter inch thick piece of plywood. And I did this both to protect my work surface underneath, but also so that I can have the feet of the laser actually sitting on the plywood so that I can burn an image into this and know that the laser is not gonna shift around. Like if I put a piece of cardboard in the middle here and then burn marks on that to align something, I wouldn't know for sure if it was gonna move. So I wanna make sure that nothing is gonna move. So I've got my safety glasses here and we will just go ahead. I've got the artwork loaded here and I am going to turn off everything except the outside perimeter line. Let me frame that up just to make sure everything is sane. That looks totally reasonable to me. So I will go ahead and just hit start and we'll output that circle. And I'm going to refocus. And of course, the focusing left a little mark, and I'll just put that up in this quadrant where there's no art. Okay, I think that's about as centered as I'm going to get it. Turn off that outer circle. Turn on the blue and black artwork. And just thinking if I've done everything, because I've only got one piece of glass here, I think that's it. Good afternoon, patrons. Got the laser running again, and yes, that is another piece of glass for an optical comparator. This is one I'm actually burning for Lance Baltzley. He's got a comparator that he's rebuilding and needed some glass. Uploading this lens clip is actually a little bit goofy because the indicator on my phone that tells me it's recording is blue, but I'm wearing safety glasses that block out the blue laser light and I can just barely see what's going on.
looks pretty good. There's a little bit of a beveled edge all the way around and I just wanted to make sure that we got coverage out there and it looks like we did. So I need to take this in, wash it off and we'll see what we got. And here are the results. I gotta say, I really could not be happier with this. I was a little bit worried because I only had the one piece of glass and I wanted it to work and it, it did. Looks like the settings that we figured out last time worked great. We've got nice, crisp, clear black. Let me flip it over so you can see it from the back side. You can see it looks all right, but when the light hits it, there's kind of a shiny specularity to the lines and it makes them really hard to make out. Let me throw some light down here behind it and see if I can show that. Yeah, it's really hard to see. In any case, I'm very pleased with the results. I don't really think this could have turned out any better. You can see that the hash marks do go around the bevel on the edge of the glass. I don't know how durable that is because the laser will have been slightly defocused, but they survived the cleaning process. So I think this is going to work. Can you hear the jets in the background? That's a very characteristic sound. Sounds like a couple of A-10s coming in to land at Gowan Field. Anyway, I will get this shipped back to Lance and we'll see how it works for him. He told me he wasn't in a big hurry and that's good because it's been sitting here for many, many months. This is why I don't do contract work. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe and maybe think about supporting the channel over on Patreon. Patrons can download files for this and all of my other projects and get a little sneak peek behind the scenes. Thank you for watching.